Hello. Just a question. Is it me or is it ext extremely hot here today? I cannot believe it. Okay, thank you very much for being here. I would like to share with you what I like to call the social warming. And let's start. Just weeks ago, Google reached quantum supremacy. There is a supercomputer being able of making a calculation that takes 10,000 years to the fastest computer ever in just 200 seconds. That is incredible. The thing is we always underestimate social changes. In 2006, for the first time in history, the urban population outgrew, outgrew sorry, the rural population. 51% of the population in the world was urban in 2006. Today it's almost 56, 56%. And in 2006, none of these technological inventions existed. I honestly could, cannot imagine how we managed to survive without WhatsApp, for example. But in 2006, all of these social things did not exist as well. The Me Too movement, the yellow vests, the riots in Chile, both Obama and Trump being presidents, all of those things existed, they, sorry, did not exist in 2006. And the thing here is, technological changes amaze us. If tomorrow we have, I don't know, this iPad that we can smell things about, we say, oh, that's amazing, or this, I don't know, flying cars, we say, oh, that's amazing. The fact with social, with social changes is they always surprise us. The things are there, but we don't see them. Technological advancement is exponential. The, the number of inventions is growing as fast as ever. And the urban population is also exponential. We are becoming more and more urban, and the informality within that urban population is growing as well. Just to give you a small number, today we have 4.4 billion people living in cities, and almost 1 billion of those lives in informality. The projections the UN has is that will be 6.6 .6 billion people living in cities, and something between 2 and 3 billion people living in informality in 2050. So today we have one in almost five citizens living in informality, and we'll go to two in four. That's exponential. The thing is, when we see social changes, we are like the boiling frog. I mean, the water gets hot and hot, and we don't perceive that temperature increase. In a really good essay, Mr. Morgan Housel says that the three big things that are happening today in the world are, first of all, the shift in demographics. Today, for the first time in history, we, we are finding more easily to maintain people alive than to make new babies. We're getting old. The, the shift in the demographic pyramids, the senior revolution, today we are working till we are 70 years old. That didn't happen just 30 years ago. The second thing is wealth inequality. We all know what wealth inequality is. And the third thing is the absolute access to information, and that is a game changer. Today, we all have access to every piece of information available. Today, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, and Jeff Bezos use the same Instagram and the same WhatsApp account and the same Google search than any people living in any of the most relegated parts of the world. That information is available to anyone, and that is a game changer. <coughs> My proposition as global, as social warming, sorry, is the combination of three different factors. The wealth inequality, the absolute access to information, and the increasing exponential growth in, informa in informality. The three things combined put us in a very difficult situation. This is Kia Sands in Johannesburg. You see the formal and the informal cities living together just a couple of meters away. Favela do Morumbi, Sao Paulo, Brazil. Guillaume Village in Seoul. And this is my barrio, the barrio where I work in, Barrio 31 in Buenos Aires City. How long do we think that, that this tension between two societies living side by side, accessing the same information, is sustainable. 
This year, 2019, November 2019, Blade Runner is no longer the future. Blade Runner is situated in November 2019. And it depicted up this topic future. Here we have a scene from Total Recall, another movie re depicting a dystopic future. The thing is, today we live in a dystopic present, but the fact that we live in it doesn't allow us to get the perspective that what we're living today is dystopic. The question is, what can we do about this? I propose three, three things. First, do your part. Second, be fluid. Oh. That was amazing. Second, be fluid. And three, speed up the, the tipping point. First, do your part, even if it's a, mic a micro part. Today, we all have seen this huge discussion regarding the last Nobel Prize in economics because of if m micro interventions are OK, or we should go to the macro interventions. And there was this huge discussion about whether Ms. Duflo, Ms. Kramer, and I never get to pronounce the name Banerjee, was well deserved or, or not. I honestly think that they completely deserve the prize. Their interventions are amazing, and they proved that they can do things that change things and then can measure them. And let me show, let me show you and share with you the part that we are doing in Barrio 31. This is the before of how the streets in the Barrio 31 look, looked like. And this is how they look today. We built 17 kilometers of infrastructure, that's sewage, drainage, uh, pavement, public lightning. We built 1,100 new houses. This was a for the former piece of land that we bought. And now we have 1,100 new houses. We try to preserve the barrio, the neighborhood as, it's, as it was. We did not want to change it. We like to call the informal settlements the medieval cities of the 20th century. So we're doing the same thing that we did with medieval cities. Nobody imagined that we will tear down the old part of Rome or Siena or whatever medieval city you can think of. What we did is we tried to put the city into formality, building infrastructure and improving houses. This is the before and after of 2,000 house improvements of the 5,000 house improvements that we will make by the end of 2023. But housing and infrastructure are not the only important parts. We built three new health centers. People didn't have access, proper access to health. This one's my favorite. This was a narco bunker in the perhaps the most difficult and hot part of the barrio where narcos ruled all over the place. There was a narco bunker that we took and we built this, which is a center for economic development. We, this part of the project had a huge success. We managed to get almost 1,000 people into new formal jobs in the city. And we incubated something like 30 projects that the people in the barrio have and, and, and allowing them to sell online and to get uh, formal payments was a huge success. Schools. This was a former building that we took apart and we built the most technological advanced, technologically advanced school in Argentina. We built three different schools within the barrio and the result is, in is incredible because this school provides the people living in the barrio the chance of succeeding. The, those kids over there will have a complete different life set up than the ones their parents have just because they have access to the best education possible. <clears throat> and we also built job training facilities. This is a new job training facility which specializes in fiber optics installation and jobs for the new era. The message here is it's not about building things. It's not about building. It's easy to say hey, we built, I don't know, thousands of things and kilometers of, of uh, infrastructure and whatever. The important, the most crucial aspect is that we need to focus on human beings. We need to have holistic solution that tackle the systemic issue of structural poverty. 
We need thousands of micro interventions. Second, be fluid. Today we all speak about fluidity. We have sex fluidity, gender fluidity. We're starting to think about job fluidity. My, in my, in the prior generation to mine, people stayed in job, I don't know, 20, 30 years, all their lifetime. Now, the next generation is thinking about what, the, what they're going to do in the next two years. Job is starting to be fluid. And I really think, think that we need to be even more fluid. The institutions, as we know them, do not work. The institutions, as we, as we know them, are not able of solving the problem. This strict things about this is the government, this is the private sector, and we are the NGO, that's part from the past. If we are to solve this, we need to work all together, and we can do it. Everything we did in the Barrio 31, we did it working hand to hand with the private sector. And that's for me, is really important because our interests are aligned. Here you have some of the companies we work with. Despegar is one of the unicorns, of one of, is a huge public company which sells tickets, sort of an Expedia in Argentina, in America actually. McDonald's, Santander, McKinsey. What is happening today? Today companies have realized that they need to do something that generates impact. And that's because of several reasons. One being their customers. I'm a fan of uh, Apple technology. I wouldn't perhaps buy an iPhone if I knew that they use, I don't know, child labor, or if they, by making iPhones, they sort of contaminate and not have a clear mind regarding global warming. That is happening with every product and every company around. And the same things happen with their, their employees. And let me share with you the story about McKinsey. You all know McKinsey, right? It's a very big consulting firm. They like to, their slogan is, the best minds in the world. And what is happening to them? They realize that today, whatever highly talented individual, he had a master's degree, a PhD degree, they are positive that they can find work everywhere. They will never have an issue regarding where to work. And they started to realize that perhaps two, three, four years after working in McKinsey, this talented individual say, you know what? I'm going to work in the Red Cross. Hey, but you're, you're going to win, I don't know, 10% of what you're winning. I don't care. I'll do it two years, and then I find another job. And a lot of their employees were starting to migrate to NGOs, to the public sector, because they wanted to make an impact in their lives. So they came up with this amazing solution, which is they formed McKinsey.org which is an NGO from McKinsey, financed by McKinsey. So I am working with them in a project to recycle everything within the Barrio 31. And the lady which leads that project from McKinsey worked in the McKinsey firm, firm and then she went to the NGO to do social impact projects because she, she didn't feel happy just doing consulting work. And maybe she, she spends two, three, four years in the McKinsey.org and then she comes back and works in the consultancy area of the company. And that is happening all around, all around. <clears throat> Despegar, for example. Despegar is a huge technological company. And we started to make this plan where we put in that economic center for development the place and the people from the barrio. And they came up with this training course six months long. They put their employees to give classes to to train people from the barrio. <clears throat> and, they, and they give a stipend to the people which, which are taking this course. When they finish, they get a formal job in the company. And what the Dispegar CEO shared with me was that they have so much demand from their employees to do this pro bono, just to go to the barrio and give classes to the people in the, in the neighborhood, that they, don't have, they have sort of this waiting list for who can and not go to, to give out the, the lessons because the, the excitement that that, that that generated within the company was amazing. No institution can do this alone. We need to work together. We need to forget about the formal institutions as we know them. Third, speed up the tipping point. 
These are my daughters, Juana, Emma, and Lola, which are 16, 14, and 12 years old in a very Generation Z uh, pose, you know, it's like taking selfies all the time. <clears throat> For they, the world in which we live in, it's incomprehensible. We are the frogs, but they are not. Generation Z does not understand why we did not do the things that we needed to do in order to change the climate crisis. They do not understand how we can live with the wealth inequality as it is. They do not understand how we can sustain living in a proper house where people next to us don't. They feel enraged with this. They say, hey, what are you doing? Get out and go to work. Do something for us. I think that the most important thing that we need to do is speed up the tipping point. They will do it. They will do it. And the problem that we have here is that there are problems that go so slow that no institution, no political institution, feels to invest the capital to change it. Social warming is the perfect example of that. Making all the necessary changes with the speed that we need to make them will take a huge political and economic cost on whoever decides that. So we don't. So we go slow. The thing is that the problem is reaching us on a much faster pace than the solutions. So these problems are fast and slow, and we have not yet been able of combining the necessary speed to solve them. I'm a huge fan of superhero movies. I found this Avengers series perhaps something completely new, because Thanos is the first, is the first supervillain that doesn't want to make things bad. He's not a supervillain that wants to destroy everything just because of it. He's a supervillain that wants something good. He wants a sustainable world, but he wants it in a bad way. He wants to exterminate half of the human population just to make the world livable. Doctor Strange analyzed in the movie 40 million 606 different, 605, sorry, possible futures. And in just one of them, we were able to defeat in Thanos. I am convinced that if we put all hands on deck, if we invest everything that we have, if we focus all of our efforts, if we keep on meeting in congresses like this, discussing and analyzing how can we solve this, what we have ahead of us is a really bright and incredible future. Thank you very much. Oh, 10 minutes left. Come on, I was great. <laughs> Questions? What about the interests of China? The what? China, China invested in Africa. China buying land in South America. So what about the yeah, I, was, I was asking you, do you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, what about a problem like, for instance, Ch China? China buys lands in South America, buys cooperation of NGOs in Africa. Uh, what about um, the interest of uh, the petrol, petrol in, uh, the chemical industry? You know, how can we uh, balance, counterbalance that? Just a question. May I have a glass of water, please? Uh, I honestly don't have a reply for that. I mean, if I knew that, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> I would be ruling the world. <laughs> uh, what I do think is that things are changing. Perhaps, I mean, some petrol company or oil company is still focused in the old mindset, but I'm convinced that they will eventually change or die. Why? Because, because of Generation Z. I mean, uh, BP, British Petroleum, now has a green logo and they're invested in alternative energies. And everybody starts, needs to shift because otherwise uh, in the next 10, 20, 30 years, they will be out of the game. The thing is that will we put our planet out of the game first? Will society uh, melt before that game really changes? Thank you very much. That is an open question and 
what I feel is that if we all keep on with the same goal in mind, I mean, we will make things faster or better. Hi, I was wondering, um, with the job fluidity, there's also this um, new tendency of people deciding to have their own uh, businesses and they're selling things through social media. Their, so own, their own what? People want to sell their own things through social media, so they're not working at the traditional enterprises, but they're having their own jobs. But this is a very informal job, so with paying taxes and everything, how do governments, how can governments um, compete with this, or how can they make this kind of jobs more formal? <coughs> well, uh, I don't necessarily think that uh, shop formality will s remain as it is, uh, just to share, share a view with you. We are completely hysterical in our preferences. We change what we want, I mean, just in one click. We are buying this, and then we buy that, and then we want this, and then we want that. And we do that, we're completely free, and we have a, an infinite chance of choosing, because everything is available. That type of behavior does not match with the job formal structure. Why? Because if demands shift all the time, the offer needs, needs to shift as well. Because what society is buying, then you don't buy it anymore. What society is choosing, then you don't choose it anymore. So if we change this, we need to change this. So I think that job formality is changing and will change even more rapidly. Hi. Um, okay, so I found this project, it's very interesting, and I find these kind of um, sh like I examples, they show that change is possible and that you can achieve something. But at the same time, I'm, I'm always concerned about how sustainable they are, and how um, how you know how wide you can like how widespread you can implement like you know you can implement this. So if you can implement it in Barrio Trento Uno, can you do it in another informal area in Buenos Aires if you don't have the government uh, at the table? And I also would like to know some more about the role of the government in this project. Like did they just give you permits and that's it, or? Was it, did it go beyond that? I am a, I am a public officer. I'm a secretary mm. of state in the Buenos Aires city government. Okay. Secretary of human and social integration. I think that the role in the government is crucial. I mean, it's definitely a part of the equation because actually this is, the, the main responsibility is from the government. What I think is that the problem is so big that government funds cannot solve it by itself. Sure. Today we're investing as a, as a race something like between 30 and 50 billion dollars a year. We need to invest something close to one trillion. There's no public money to do that. That's unsustainable. So if we don't get the private sector in, we won't succeed. We need to come up with solutions in which public funds, I mean, sorry, private funds, invest as they invest, for example, in, uh, I don't know, uh, alternative energies. And we have green bonds that prove that investment firms can put their money in place in uh, green bonds, for example. We need to come up with social bonds because the amount of money that we need is immense, immense. So I think that the, <clears throat> the challenge that we have is how do we get the private sector to play this game? Because in the way that we are doing it, this is not scalable. We don't have the scale that we need, so we need to get the private sector in. How is yet to be defined. I was speaking yesterday with Elkin from, from the UN, precisely addressing this issue. <clears throat> Solutions are not yet been, are not ready yet, but we are starting to walk in that direction. But, okay, so is the National Policy uh, Institute development? Or is it dependent on the case? Sorry, sorry, what? Is the policy, uh, the official national policy towards informal settlements? 
in situ development like here? Or is in, the it city of, in the city of Buenos Aires, we're yeah. working really hard on four different neighborhoods, Barrio 31, Barrio 20, Fraga, and Rodrigo Bueno, which are four different neighborhoods in, the, in Buenos Aires. And the policy of the Buenos Aires city is transforming the informality into formality. That is what we're looking for. Anyway, even if we achieve it, we only have 250,000 people living in Buenos Aires in the informality. In Argentina, we have 4 million. And there are 900 million in the world. So, I mean, perhaps we can achieve scale in Buenos Aires, but we're just a grain of sand in the global problem. My, my, my point is, if we don't get more commitment from the private sector, we can do it. Yeah, I understand that point. But, okay, so you would like to transform all these informal settlements into formal settlements. But, okay, how are you managing, uh, for example, increases in value of land and maybe the possibility that they would be displaced from their, like, their uh, locations, Gentrific their neighborhoods, actually? Yeah, gentrification is a huge issue, which we don't have yet fixed formulas to solve it. What we did to avoid gentrification is two things. Going back to numbers, we have a stock problem, 900 million people mm -hmm. in informality, and we have a flux problem, which is almost 2 billion people coming to informality in the next 30 years. So in Barrio 31, which is perhaps close to the most expensive land in Latin America, it's just 200 meters away from the most expensive land in Latin America, the gentrification push is really huge. We approached that issue with three different solutions. First of all, construction permits. Just, uh, I'm going to get quite into details, so I'm sorry about that. But, uh, in Buenos Aires City, the smallest piece of land that you can have is 300 meters, 300 square meters. That is the smallest one. In the Barrio 31, we decided and we placed a law that the biggest piece of land is 250. So the smallest 300, the biggest 250. Why? So that private investors cannot come, buy several houses and build a huge parcel. The biggest parcel is just 250 meters. Second thing, height. No more than three stories high. Why is that? To avoid what happened, for example, in, in mid-packing district with the High Line. We got small houses, and as you can build this huge skyscrapers, small houses get displaced because of money. So those two things put a stop on the, on the value of land. Third thing, we have a census of all the people living in the barrio. And those people are the beneficiaries of the project. So once we give you the title, the formal title for your house, you can sell it to any other people within that community. And the state will not intervene in that. If you sell it, I am a beneficiary of the project, and I sell it to you, which are a beneficiary of the project, that's it. It's a private transaction. We don't mess with it. But if you sold your land to someone who is not within the project, who is not a beneficiary, <coughs> the external person who acquires the land needs to pay three times the original value of the land to the government as a tax. And why is that? Just to put up stop on price. So if I'm willing to pay $100,000 to, to you that own a piece of land in, in Barrio 31, and I need to pay $75,000 to the government, then I won't give you $100,000, I will give you twenty five. dollars So your interest to sell will be less. <coughs> and anyway, just to be clear, the only real solution to gentrification is increasing people's income. That's the only solution. The only way to avoid gentrification is that the people of the Barrio 31 earn their wages. Any other thing that we do, that making the people in the Barrio 31 being able of earning more money is just a short-term measure to avoid gentrification. In the long term, what we need to do is we need to give the people in the Barrio 31 the possibility to thrive. That's the only real solution. Thank you so much. Well, okay, uh, thank you very much for sharing your time with me and for listening, and hope to see you another time.